Good evening and welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. We're just going to let everyone into the Zoom and then we will get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good evening for those of you just joining. Welcome Northern Kentucky History Hour viewers and welcome to those of you joining on Facebook Live. Uh, whether you're on Zoom or on Facebook, we are so happy to have you here this evening. Um, I think we've got just about everybody, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Tara Johnson Nome, and this is Northern Kentucky History Hour, episode 36. And um, tonight's conversation about Covington's Cathedral is um, absolutely something that I've been looking forward to for a while. We've got just a couple of things that we are going to go over before we get started for those that are watching via Zoom. So for those of you on Zoom, you might notice uh, that your microphone is muted and we ask you to please keep it that way, but we do want to hear from you. So if you have a question or a comment, we do hope that you'll put that in the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation and I'll make sure to uh, gather up your questions and ask them at the end. Um, also, you're welcome to keep your video on, but just as a reminder, even when the screen is being shared and uh, maybe you can't see everybody, um, some of us who are uh, on a uh, desktop computer, we can see you. So just uh, keep that in mind. If you want to turn your video off, you're welcome to do that. It's up to you. Um, and I do want to take this moment to thank Behringer Crawford Museum. Uh, this event is made possible by the museum and its staff. Um, I'm on the board of trustees for the museum, actually serving as uh, vice president of the board this year. And um, it has been my absolute pleasure to work with all the other trustees, the staff, director, Lori Risch. Um, I see many of their names in the uh, participants tonight. Um, and so just want to say thank you to them and thank you to the financial um, supporters of the museum. The museum is funded by the city of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, excuse me, the Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, and the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation. We are also supported by our members. And many of you, I know, I see the names, are already members. And so we want to say thank you. But if you enjoy this programming and you're not yet a member, we would love it if you would go to bcmuseum.org and find out how to join. And with that, I am going to get right to tonight's speaker because I know he has a lot to share. Um, tonight, we are joined by Stephen Insweiler. He is a writer an author of many articles and stories about Covington's Cathedral, and he is an expert on Gothic architecture and the Gothic and religious art revival movements of the 19th century. His work has appeared in such publications as the Kentucky Inquirer, the Northern Kentucky Tribune, Catholic Digest, and more. He has been featured in film and video projects about the cathedral, including the film series, The Chair, by DeSales Media for KET, WCPO, and WKRC. He's a graduate of Xavier University where he received his degree in journalism in 1979. And he currently writes for the Tribune's Our Rich History series, where he's working on a series about the cathedral. So Mr. Insweiler, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, good to be here. And um, if you want, you can go ahead and go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I think we rehearsed this before. Indeed. Here we go. All right. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption here in Covington. Um, this cathedral is, is probably without a doubt one of the most unique landmarks, not only in Covington, but also in the Midwest and maybe even in the country. I mean, it's, it's one of those kinds of structures that you look at it and you say, that should not be here. Uh, why is that here? And, <clears throat> you know, the, the talk I'm going to give tonight is uh, there's just so much to tell about this 
this structure so much material and so much history, I can't get to all of it. But what I wanted to do was in answering that question, and I get it a lot from the different tours that I give and some of the other docents that we have, they get it too, is why is this here? Um, I'd like to answer kind of two questions or present two perspectives to this cathedral uh, to answer that question. And the first, of course, is the ar architecture itself. Why, when the builders were deciding to build a new St. Mary's Cathedral, did they choose Gothic? And the second one is with the Gothic, you know, you have all this stained glass, um, all these stained glass windows in it. And that, of course, is what the cathedral is really known for. But we can't, you know, we can't really understand any Gothic cathedral without first understanding what it means to be Gothic. And both in its overall design and in its architectural features and why it's so important, especially how it impacted the people and, and influenced, you know, the local culture over the last hundred years. We also have to understand the people who built it and why they built it at all. You know, what was going through their minds when they were thinking about putting up this particular type of structure? This cathedral was not the result of some fanciful idea that someone came up with, you know, well, this just looks like it, it's a good idea to do it. But, you know, let's, let's, make, let's do some definitions first. You know, we talk, everybody calls it the Cathedral Basilica. And that really is two titles. You know, um, in the, you know, the cathedral comes from the word cathedra, which is Greek meaning a chair. And when you have a diocese, you have a bishop. And when you have a bishop, you have a chair which is the, the bishop's cathedra. And that is the uh, symbol of the bishop's teaching authority in a diocese. Basilica is, um, is actually a Latin word. It's also a Greek word, but uh, it's, the basilica is an honorary, honorific title that's granted by the Pope that establishes a special relationship between the Pope himself and the faith community that is embodied in this cathedral. And the title of basilica is bestowed for one of two reasons, historical significance and the beauty, beauty of its architecture or art. So, you know, what exactly is this cathedral basilica? Let's give it some definitions. First of all, it's a French Gothic cathedral designed and built in the high Gothic style, which is 12th to about the 14th century. Um, and it possesses all of the necessary architectural features that make it a true Gothic cathedral. Uh, pointed arches, vaulted ceilings, flying, flying buttresses, the works, you name it. And the architect who designed this cathedral uh, designed the body of it to be to resemble Notre Dame on the outside. And inside predominantly is Saint Denis Cathedral. They aren't copies, but they are after or inspired by those French cathedrals. There are other aspects to it that, are, that have been taken from Chartres Cathedral, Rons Cathedral, and Cologne Cathedral uh, in France. So here, what you're looking at is about 100 million pounds of stone. It's Bedford limestone from Indiana. The foundation reaches 50 feet into the earth and the facade rises 130 feet above the streets of Covington. Interestingly, it's longer on the inside than the Statue of Liberty is high. There's no steel or iron girders or support construction within the stone walls or the columns itself. It's all stone on stone, built pretty much the way the medieval builders would have built it. The walls are five to six feet thick with interlocking brick and mortar construction on the inside and then faced with limestone, uh, both inside the cathedral as well as outside. The interior columns are all stone on stone with keying uh, for alignment and then mortar to, to hold it together. And all of this was built in the late 1890s. Well, anyone who's ever been into a Gothic cathedral, whether Europe, whether uh, this one here, has can, pretty much knows what, what this experience is like. The eyes lift up almost involuntarily and they follow those long finger-like graceful vertical lines and curving gently upward toward the vault, pointing skyward. Gothic, Gothic architecture <clears throat> is by its nature what we call organic architecture. And organic means it promotes harmony between the human world and the natural world. And in the process, it also takes us outside of both the human world and the natural world, which I will describe and explain here in a little bit. But in this image, you can easily imagine that you're in a forest standing here, looking up at trees spreading their limbs. You have these vertical lines 
you know, the medieval builders of the great Gothic cathedrals of Europe, to them, this design was intended to draw the eyes upward toward heaven. That was the point of this particular architecture. Um, the experience really doesn't stop there, though, because once the eyes go up, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I say the eyes go up and they don't want to come down again. And no matter what you try to do, you can't get them to come down again either. But, you know, once they're up, they find all kinds of things. Um, and what I'm going to talk about next are the windows. Now, we've talked about the Gothic architecture as a means of raising the eyes. But then that's one experience. We also have another experience going on in these types of cathedrals, and that happens with the glass. Now, the Cathedral Basilica is known far and wide for its stained glass windows. And to explain those, I'm going to begin with this man here, Ebat Suger, who was the abbot of Saint-Denis in Paris in, about, uh, in the 12th century. He was a mystic. And he built the Gothic additions that you see on the right to the existing Romanesque structure of the cathedral in the 12th century, beginning about 1137. Now, the thing about Gothic architecture <clears throat> is with the pointed arch, you redirect the lines of stress from upward vertically downward instead of outward, which is what the Romanesque style did. So when you, you can point the stresses downward from the roof, they can go into the columns and the, and the piers and the uh, engaged columns or pilasters on the walls, and they don't have to put any stress in the walls themselves. <clears throat> so what you can do is thin out the walls, raise the ceiling, and open up these spaces between the columns for all of this glass. And this is what Sujar and his builders figured out in 1137. So here for the first time in history, we have two complementary forms of art that Sujar and his contemporaries used to be able to communicate meditative and mystical beliefs about the Christian faith and the Christian experience, the faith experience. Sujar, as I mentioned, was a mystic. He was a follower of John Scotus and uh, Bern uh, Bernard of Clairvaux. And the mystics of the Middle Ages all believed that light is a divine aspect. Mysticism promoted a reliance on spiritual intuition as a means of acquiring knowledge of mysteries that you couldn't understand any other way. So Bernard of Clairvaux went so far as to direct his builders and say that they must build in a certain way to, so, that, um, so that the form and light is peculiarly conducive to meditation. <clears throat> well, Suger articulated that thought about light and bringing light into the interior of the Gothic cathedral this way. And he said, when the enchanting beauty of the house of God has overwhelmed me, when the charm of the multicolored gems has led me to transpose material things to immaterial things and reflect on the diversity of the sacred virtues, then it seems to me that I can see myself as if in a reality residing in some strange region of the universe, which had no previous existence and that by the grace of God, I can be transported mystically from life on this earth to the higher realm. And in our own day, we have Georges Duby, the French art historian who said, plainly, God is light. And every creature stems from that initial uncreated creative light. Every creature transmits the divine illumination. And that's the point of what the mystics were trying to get at in the Middle Ages, to try to communicate both in a, in a joint effort between the Gothic architecture and the light of the windows, this experience of divinity. And once they divined this perspective with, of light, the thinking began to find its way into all kinds of other forms of expression, artistic expression, of course, <clears throat> into clothing and uh, painting, even music. The builders, and what you see here is every, everything from inside the Cathedral Basilica, they understood all of this, medieval design and thinking and mysticism. You know, and, and it sounds strange that in our own day, this, this thinking is still here, it's still around. It was around in 1894 when Bishop Moss came here to, uh, and he, he found out that he had to put a new cathedral up. But the question is, you know, how did this thinking of the Middle Ages get to Covington, Kentucky? You know, it's a good question. And briefly, 
It's because of something called the Gothic Revival Movement, which began really about 1740 at, in the Western world. And it really peaked about the 19th century, late 19th century, and it ended before about 1930. <clears throat> and this is when increasingly serious and learned admirers of neo-Gothic style started to revive the medieval Gothic architecture and their ideas about art and mysticism and how to express this sort of thing. And between, if you look in the, in the uh, record of between 1830 to really about 1910, across the world, there's just thousands of Gothic churches and cathedrals were being produced in waves and waves of church building. Um, along with this came the revival, the uh, religious art revival movement. Uh, which was not limited to architecture, but also to music, clothes, painting, stained glass. Um, but we're going to talk about the stained glass. Um, and here's where it all begins. This is uh, Camillus Paul Maas, who was our third Bishop of Covington. He was born in Belgium in 1846 in Cotri, West Flanders, in Belgium. And at the time of his birth, the uh, Gothic revival movement was in full swing. And the religious revival movement in America was just getting underway. Uh, he was an only child, and his entire family on both sides was very religious. His father's sister was a Carmelite nun. Both the brothers on his, of his mother were both Catholic priests. And he was baptized on the day he was born, and then also uh, brought into the, uh, he was registered with the uh, Our Lady, of, the scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which is, for those who aren't Catholic, it's a, it's a devotion to Our Lady who has the title of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And it's a, it's a um, devotional item that's worn around the neck. So throughout his life, uh, Camillus, you know, he had this Marian devotion and he was terribly religious. Um, but this devotion really was accelerated by a near fatal accident or mishap that happened to him when he was a boy. Now this is the River Lys in Cotri, not far from where Camillus grew up. And it's, it's, we think the, the relative location of where the accident happened. He was, he was in a boat with some of his friends and he fell into the river, you know, mis unbalanced. He fell in and he was quickly swept downstream and he was unable to swim and he almost, he was drowning. He was in the process of drowning when some workmen fished him out and they saw that he was clutching his scapula and convinced that the Virgin Mary had saved him that day, he resolved to wear the scapular for the rest of his life in devotion to her. He moves on. His father dies when he's about 13 and he has to go to work. And he takes a job in an architect's office. And he learns about Gothic architecture there. He learns all about the drafting, the construction, everything. Uh, when his mother dies the following year, he goes to live with one of his mother's brothers, a Catholic priest, and he eventually forms a, uh, an interest in the priesthood when he's about 16. <clears throat> I'm going to go quickly through this. These are the seminaries he went to, and there's an interesting story in the preparatory seminary on the left side of your screen. While he was attending here, there, he, he was dazzled by this address of a visiting bishop from the South Sea Islands who described missionary work. And he resolved then and there, Maz did, that he wanted to do missionary work. Well, the gentleman in the upper right is, was the, uh, the right Reverend Peter Paul Lefebvre. He was the Bishop of Detroit in the uh, 1860s. And he, it was common practice for American bishops to go to Europe to recruit seminarians. Well, he recruited Maz in 1867. He had to wait another year until Maz finished his work. <clears throat> but Maz really impressed him. So he goes to the American College in Louvain. Uh, that's the picture on the left. Uh, that picture was taken about 10 years after Maz was actually there. <clears throat> and then he was ordained at St. Rumboldt's Cathedral in Mecklenburg, Belgium. Now, as I was going through all these slides, I want to ask everybody in your own mind, did you notice anything interesting? And the answer to that is the architecture is almost all Gothic. If you look at the image on the right, St. Rumboldt's Cathedral, the body of the church is, is very close to the design of the Cathedral Basilica. So you can see that Maz had all this stuff in his head. He grew up with it. He was thinking it. He was going into the service of the church. 
which itself has a devotion to this type of architecture. So in 1868, he heads on a boat to America and he's a priest in the diocese of Detroit for 16 years. He did very well. He was a terrific administrator, terrific money manager, very charismatic priest. But when he came to Huffington in 1885, it all went downhill and he, things did not go well for him. First of all, he had, there was, yep, slipped one. First of all, there was this crushing death that the diocese had left him. And then the Covington Diocese at the time was the eastern half of Kentucky. It was a huge territory. And the, he had almost very few priests. Uh, he had only 38 priests to cover the eastern half of Kentucky. And the, with the burdensome financial trials that had worn away the sympathies of the people, the people in the, di in the parishes had centralized their interests on their own parishes. And they had no interest in being part of a diocese at all. This is something that Maz called the spiritual narrowness of the people. But if you wanted a symbol of that narrowness, all you had to do is look at the old cathedral herself. Uh, it was built in 1853 uh, when we first became a diocese. And this is a late picture. When Maz came, this is he saw a lot of this. If you look, if, if everyone can see my pointer, what I'm pointing at here. This is water damage. Uh, the white stuff is what they call efflorescence and it's salts leaching out of the brick. You can see some of the brick is even missing here in this chimney or this, this tower. And if you look at the next picture, and of course all of this is from wall damage and leaking gutters and stuff. With efflorescence, that brick is gonna eventually fail. Uh, and here is the interior of the cathedral taken probably about 1890, and you can see the water damage in the ceiling. Maz, he wrote to Archbishop Elder in Cincinnati, and he says, the old Catholic church is falling in ruin. And then he does something. He says, hence the work of building a new cathedral is absolutely necessary. And trusting in God and in the charitable disposition of many, I am erecting a building which will give a respectable standing to the community. Bishop Maz just collided with the Gothic revival movement. All right, the story takes an interesting turn. Heavily in debt, no money, no ability to raise money. The banks told him we don't loan money to people like you because in our experience, institutions like yours don't pay us back. But one summer afternoon, he got a visit from a little girl who knocked on his door and came into his office. And according to the Kentucky Post article, she told, she placed a silver dollar, like the one on the right-hand side of the screen, in his hand and said, this is from my allowance, and I want you to build your cathedral with it. She left, and Maz took that silver dollar and put it in his desk drawer for safekeeping. It was the first dollar ever contributed for the building of the new St. Mary's Cathedral. The identity of the little girl remains a mystery to this day. But in the child's impossible request, Maz saw something. He saw or recognized the elements of a providential or a divine commission. Now we know this from a lot of his writings and from interpreting a lot of the uh, a lot of his actions and uh, things that he wrote to different people and such in his letters and records. But he held <clears throat> the Christian belief that sometimes God employs children to make his will known to men. Maz had a real fondness for children, but in the same way as he believed that the Virgin Mary once saved him from drowning as a boy, he also came to believe that he had been chosen to build this new cathedral for the people of Covington but he had absolutely no idea how he was gonna do it. He also, by the way, he did have the faith that if God wanted it done, by gosh, he would provide the means to do it. He also began to understand about the same time that building a new cathedral would heal the spiritual narrowness of the fragmenting diocese of the, excuse me, of the people and eventually reunite the diocese. And that was perhaps the real motive behind you know, why Providence wanted this cathedral built. It wasn't a nice thing to put into the middle of the city. It was really about people. 
Well, 1890, everything changes. A man on the left is James Nicholas Walsh, who in his will bequeathed Maz $25,000 specifically for building the cathedral. Walsh was a wealthy distiller. He was an immigrant from Ireland. And at one point, his Walsh distillery was the largest in America. It produced the most whiskey in all of the country. His partner on the right is Peter O'Shaughnessy. And two years later, O'Shaughnessy gave Maz another $100,000 in interest-bearing gold bonds for the new cathedral's construction. And Maz purchased the Delaney residence, which is still in existence, by the way. It's the uh, rectory building right next to the cathedral. And then the McVeigh residence on the corner of 12th and Madison. And he started planning his cathedral. For his architect, he chose a relatively unknown Leon Cocard from Detroit. Now, he knew Cocard from Detroit. He knew him actually when Cocard was a teenager. Uh, he, we, we were pretty sure that Maz knew Cocard's father, Nicholas Cocard, who was from Paris and he was a carpenter and became a very, very prosperous builder in Detroit. When he died, he had something like seven really nice properties. Leon Cocard today is called America's Cathedral Builder. Uh, during his lifetime, he designed two great Gothic cathedrals in the US, St. Mary's here and the cathedral in Denver, Colorado. And he's also credited with designing St. Anne's Church in Detroit. And there's a little dispute about this, but in at the age of 19, he signed on uh, as a draftsman for Albert, a guy named Albert French, who was contracted to, de de to design this St. Anne's Cathedral, this St. Anne's Church. And you see it on the outside and on the inside in the right-hand picture. But French was a significant figure in Cocard's life because as a draftsman, he taught Cocard not only how to draw the plans, how to draw the blueprints, but also what the stresses were like, <clears throat> what kind of angles you needed to make the pointed arch in order to get the right stresses in the columns without going into the walls. You know, there's things like that you had to consider. French taught Cocard all of that to the point where Cocard eventually, we think pretty much took over all of the drafting and some of the designing of the cathedral, of the church here itself. Maz, who was a priest in Detroit, would have known about this church and would have known French and probably knew Cocard as well. And that's why he chose Cocard, Leon Cocard, without ever putting out any bids to anyone else. I select you because I am pleased with your art and work. Allow me to add also that I have my own way of selecting you against the notions and personal interests of many here. And there were a lot of people who did not want to hire Cocard. But Maz believed that if God wanted this cathedral to be built, he would provide the means. And suddenly Maz saw money coming in. He saw his architect right before his eyes. And he was ready to, uh, he contracted Cocard and off they went to the races. <clears throat> this is where it gets interesting, folks. I guess, I hope you got your seat belts on. This was Leon Cocard's first design. Now, can you imagine our cathedral looking like that? Well, if you see, he used the cruciform of Cologne Cathedral to design or to help him design the proportions of the interior. Now, what you see on the left picture pretty much the body of the cathedral is what we have today. That's, he's kept that, that particular part of the uh, uh, design intact through his several series of plans. But the facade is actually after Cologne Cathedral. And if you look in the right-hand drawing, which is Cocard's, you can see elements of the Cologne Cathedral. He stuck to that for a while. Uh, you can see this is his second drawing. Um, and in it, you see a lot of those the same elements as the first, but much more refined. You can see the body of the church on the left is pretty much what is there today. Now on the right, he's still playing around with Cologne Cathedral, you can tell. And he's also added these spires or pinnacles at the tops of the bell towers, which is so interesting because no French cathedral, no German cathedral has them. English cathedrals do. This is the blueprint of the, the plan, the second plan. 
And this is eventually what got built, although the names have changed to protect the innocent. Uh, the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, for example, used to be called the Ladies' Chapel. It was originally intended for Our Lady. Um, <clears throat> but as you can see, what's interesting is the, here's the old Delaney House, which is the rectory today. But this was supposed to be connected all the way to the cathedral. And eventually that was all scrapped because Maz did not feel he could spend the money to do so. And the plans changed throughout the, the, the two years that he was doing the design work. Now, this is a blueprint of a cross section of cocards <clears throat> looking east toward the apse. So we're like, we're, we're in the back of the church looking to the front of the church. And you can see all the classic Gothic elements, the buttresses, the, the, the uh, pointed arches, the vaulting, and those beautiful verticals that he has incorporated into all of these columns, all of these uh, engaged columns in the wall. Here's another one of his final. It shows it's a cross section looking south along the south aisle. To the left is the sanctuary where the altar would be. Here is the organ, organ loft or the choir loft, the rose window, and this is the nave. And he's defined the sections of the, the nave and sanctuary, the triforium, <clears throat> excuse me, and the clerestory. And if you notice on the right are some of the elements of the tower that he wanted to build. In 1895, building had gone so well that they were ready to lay the cornerstone. And here's another interesting twist. The Enquirer reported during this event, by the way, the cornerstone was laid in this column right here where my cursor is. But the Enquirer reported a little golden haired girl dressed in pure white and reflecting from her face, religious faith and innocence clung to the cornerstone and hung there during the ceremonies. Now, Maz would have noticed her, and from what we understand, nobody tried to shoo her away. But during the ceremony, you know, she clung on that cornerstone as Maz, you know, placed the brass box in and mortared it over. Well, in that little time capsule that he had put into that column were a lot of different artifacts, but what included was a small velvet case containing the silver dollar given to him by that little girl years before. So Maz probably thought, hmm, here's another child. And it was probably a sign to him, knowing his belief system, that God was telling him it's going well, keep going. This is one of the only photos of the interior construction uh, from 1894 to 1901. You notice Maz, <clears throat> anyone who, who ever, who's ever been involved in a contracting project, you can understand why his hair has turned white. Uh, we thought this might have been Cocard on the left because he's wearing a tie, but we think that's actually J.W. Kelly, who Maz hired to, uh, do, to supervise the construction. And you'll notice these steel girders here. Those were eventually removed. Uh, those were not part of the final construction. Those were for cranes and lifting and so on and so forth. I have two pictures. <clears throat> this is the cathedral. This is a Leon Cocard photograph. Uh, this is circa 1900. You'll notice there's no glass in the windows. The front is not finished. And you notice there's no facade being put on. And that was because the bishop ran out of money and ordered that it just be bricked up. And he would deal with the facade construction later. You can see in this photograph, which is taken about the same time, you know, there's no glass in the windows. Uh, even the rose window here is, is, is plastered over. But when it finally got finished, this is what we had. This is a photograph by Cocard, and we can date this photograph to January 28, 1901. And this is the cathedral right after its dedication. I can tell you, if you remember what the old cathedral looked like, the people of Covington, when they first saw this, <clears throat> had never seen anything like it before. And they would, no one would see anything like it since. Now, Bishop Maz, okay, now we turn back to the facade. And this is where from about 1901 to 1905, 1906, 
he was working with Leon to try to uh, build this facade. But in 1906, something happened to Leon. He suffered from what we understand, some kind of a nervous breakdown and was replaced by an architect from Newport named David Davis. And he was a specialist in Gothic architecture. <clears throat> Around the same time, while Maz was trying to figure out how he was gonna pay for all of this, this man, whose name is Nicholas Walsh, he made the facade project possible in 1905, donating an additional $50,000 to Maz for the facade project. And in 1908, the project began. This is an early photograph. The man on the left is believed to be David Davis. Now, in this follow-on photograph, you can see the man right here. And the reason why we think it's David Davis Oops, wrong way. Glad I'm not flying an airplane. Okay, the reason why we think that's David Davis is because we have another photograph of the construction of St. Patrick's Church in Maysville, which Davis built. And we have the same man standing in the same pose with the same hat, the same bow tie, and the same stance with the same sloping shoulders and the same general build. And so two men like that, that are almost identical. So we think it's actually David Davis. So now you get to meet one of the architects of the cathedral. In this one, we're halfway up. You can see this is just above the portals. We have the central portal here. We have the south portal and then the north portal on the right. And you can see how they constructed the walls. Now this is where the photograph was taken. This is inside what is now inside the south tower. <clears throat> but you can look and see the columns that were placed. You can see another one coming down from a uh, block and tackle. But if you look at these massive chunks of limestone, these are all solid pieces of quarried limestone from Indiana. And on one of these, Clement Barnhorn is going to carve his relief and he's gonna do all of his sculpture on that particular piece of limestone in 1912 and then later in 1919. So, but you can see the thickness is probably about a six foot thick brick that is the interior construction of the wall. And this is strange, I mean, this is how the, the medieval builders did it. You know, only they would use stone and mortar. So these, here are a few more um, pictures of the, uh, the cathedral facade going up. And this is the final product. This is from a 1911 postcard. <clears throat> and you can see there's no carvings in the portals and there's no glass, which is probably why the photographer or the postcard maker decided to paint a rose colored image in that place. Well, 1910, when it was finished, was Maz's 25th Silver Jubilee. And the Gothic cathedral he had envisioned for the people of Covington was finally finished. Well, sort of, because cathedrals are never really finished. It's kind of like the journey of faith. It's only finished when, you know. The windows would continue to be designed and uh, that's where we turn to next. Now the windows in the cathedral basilica, um, they are made in a similar fashion to the windows in Saint-Denis or any of the other windows in Notre Dame or Reims Cathedral. And they were made by the Mayor of Munich Company. Uh, they're called Mayor of Munich today. They were Mayor, uh, Mayor and Company in 1910. But the windows started to go in about 1906 <clears throat> and they went in one at a time painstakingly uh, as Moz could get the money to pay for them. And they had what they called subscriptions where people buy a piece of the window or they would buy the whole window. And there are 82 windows in total, uh, 78 mayor windows and four Tyrolean Art Glass Company windows. Those were the two makers of the windows. And the, uh, so you see also down here, you know, the proximate time frames they went in. <clears throat> a clerestory window 
uh, was about $2,000, which today is about 65,000. If you prorate it for, you know, uh, for the economy and all that. The reason why we have two makers and why Tyrolean only has four uh, glass windows is because we had a world war and a moratorium on German exports from 1917 to 1919. In 1917, Mayer contracted Tyrolean art glass of Innsbruck, Austria, who started producing windows for Mayer, who was going to then send them to us. But the moratorium extended to Austria and eventually those went into a warehouse and we didn't get them until 1920. So allow me to introduce you to Mayer of Munich in 1910, this is a photo that was sent to me by one of the uh, historians at Mayer. And you can see <clears throat> the uh, in the front is what they call a colorizer, who they would draw cartoons, colorize them, and then send them to the client who would then look them over and approve them or change them. Moz was always happy with Mayer, and that's why he chose him. He put out bids, and there were five or six companies that tried to get the contract, but Mayer was the the one that uh, that made my uh, Moz chose. So the thing about Mayor of Munich was the, the mayor's artists all worked in the neo-Gothic style, you know, which took that style from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. If you look at the the the, the windows, you know, like this one here from the uh, Great North transept window, you know, this one here uh, is it's all done in kind of a Renaissance style, which is very typical of Gothic revival. So, and you can see in the detail here from the Immaculate Conception window, the, the extraordinary details. This glass was, is actually called a pot metal process glass, um, which Mayer chose because it produced extra lead, the, the formula produced extra lead in the glass, which made the colors dazzlingly bright and vibrant, which is what you want. That's what the kind of glass that was produced in the Middle Ages. Well, the Gothic Revival movement brought back these concepts of intense color and, and these kinds of forms in the glass. And we had companies uh, like Mayer, Torlian Art Glass, Settler, and they use these, they all use these old formulas for the uh, for making the glass. Now, Mayer, this is this style of glass work is called the pictorial style, sometimes called Bavarian pictorial style or Munich pictorial style. And stylistically, it is a very Renaissance oriented. <clears throat> and to give you an idea of the middle, this is a Middle Ages glass. This is from Sandini. And this is a piece of uh, stained glass, <clears throat> circa 13th century. And this is what Mayer produced. Now, if you've been to the cathedral and you, you have the opportunity to, to get up close or use a telephoto or something, this is really not a very good picture because the detail is just exquisite. And at some other time, uh, I'll describe the process by how they did this extraordinary detail. It would take, I think, a little bit too long to describe here, but suffice it to say, <clears throat> they make the glass, they paint the detail on it, and then they paint this stuff called Schwarzlot or something similar. It's like a burnt sienna kind of a, or a, a burnt umber kind of a, a tincture. Let it dry, and then they would sand it and they would sand it to get these shadows and gradients. And then they would refire it and then put it into the leaded portions of the, the window, which was then in modular form and they would ship it, uh, ship it out to America that way. Mayer did something else very interesting. They used other compositional tools to incorporate divinity into the windows. Now, what you're looking at is the use or employment of what's called the the divine ratio or the golden ratio or the sec sectio divina, which is a compositional style that actually goes back to Plato, um, who theorized that the divine ratio, if you take a segment and you divide it a certain way and the larger has a relationship to the, to the whole, then you have this um, special proportional relationship. And this, in the Middle Ages, this idea was gotten a hold of by a guy named Fibonacci. And for those of you who are mathematicians in the audience, you know about the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci noticed that Plato's theory as an absolute numerical ratio appears throughout nature. 
it appears in the trees, it appears in the, in, in the mountains, it appears in the flowers, it appears in all kinds of structures in nature. It's a sort of design that is universally efficient in living things and is aesthetically pleasing to the human eye. So what Mayer was doing was taking what was being used in the Middle Ages and even before, and you can see two examples. One is in the pink and the other one is in the yellow. And you can see how the proportions get smaller and smaller. If you look at a Nautilus shell, this spiral is what happens inside a Nautilus shell, for example. So this, this, and if anyone who's ever watched um, the Polar Express, you can thank Fibonacci and his sequence because all of that computer, uh, computer graphics is all done through the Fibonacci sequence. Now the most famous, so that was an example of how, we, how they used to put divinity. They also put divinity in through colors which I, I don't have time to go into uh, at this particular moment. But this is the most famous window in the cathedral. It's the great north transept window. <clears throat> Some call it the largest in the world. It is not. Uh, we found a larger picture in Regensburg, Germany, uh, in a Lutheran cathedral. However, this is the largest church pictorial stained glass window in the United States, and we think in the world, pictorial style window. It is in its own right, the third or fourth largest in the world. And we're still doing the research. Um, it does tell the story of the Council of Ephesus. And it's broken up into four parts. The, Loret the Litany of Loretto, which is a Marian litany in the top. The crowning of Mary in the upper middle. Lower middle actually illustrates, and we've seen this picture before, the uh, Council of Ephesus. And then we have Marian theologians at the bottom. In May 1915, Maz passes away. And he leaves his work to finish the windows to his assistant, Ferdinand Brossard. And Brossard goes on, and he the war ends, and he gets the windows, and he finishes the work. So now in 1923, under uh, Brossard, we have the two, arc, the, the two Gothic art forms together. But it took the Gothic art revival movement, which Maz fell smack dab in the middle of, and he found the right architect, and he found the right sect architect, and every and he got the right amount of money. Now, $175,000 was the original estimate, and the latest figure I saw on paper was about $225,000 to $250,000 in the day, which today is somewhere multiply by 28 and you get the value today. So Maz did actually realize the, uh, the construction of this cathedral. His, his vision is complete now. In 2013, so what does this all mean to us as people who come and go through the cathedral? Well, this cathedral really is the European experience in Covington. And it's put there, it was, it was there very deliberately constructed for the people of Covington by Maz and all of the clergy and all of the builders and all of the architects who knew about this, ar this architecture and what glass could do and how you could integrate it into, uh, into a, an integrated whole. But this is what uh, a reporter said about it when he went around to the different cathedrals in America for the Sean, uh, actually it's Michael Sean Winters. I mis miswrote it there. But he's, he visited all the cathedrals in America and he was trying to find the most beautiful. And he found two, the cathedral in San Antonio and this one here. And this is what he had to say about it. Where most cathedrals tend to be, let's see, where, tend to be dark, where most cathedrals tend to be dark when one enters the cathedral basilica of Assumption, it's like waking up inside of a diamond. Now, if Suger were here today, would he have the same experience of being transported mystically from life on this earth to a higher realm? Look at this photograph. This is what Suger would be greeted by. Would he experience the waking up inside of a diamond? You know, if you talk to parishioners who come in, who are, are not regulars necessarily, but pilgrims, members of the public who come 
the answer they would give you would be yes. Suger would have that experience because that's the experience I see them having. And it's not an unusual experience to watch. You know, the eyes go up and then the windows, the windows, the windows. So did Moz accomplish what he set out to accomplish? Yes, he did. It was his vision that made all of this happen. Most importantly, in the building of this cathedral, Maz was able to bring back the spiritually narrow lost sheep of a fragmenting diocese that had been falling apart. And since that day, the Diocese of Covington has remained a, a, a united and quite a vibrant Christian community. So what is the French Gothic Cathedral doing in the middle of Covington, Kentucky? Maz would probably tell you that it was a providential response to the needs of the people who were in a crisis, a faith community that was in the process of disintegrating and losing their identity. The historical record certainly supports this statement. One last postscript. After Bishop Moss's death, he was buried at St. Mary's Cemetery up in Fort Mitchell. He intended to be buried in a crypt beneath the cathedral, but that crypt wasn't finished yet at the time of his death. And actually, it never did get finished. So for 105 years, he was up there in St. Mary's Cemetery. In 2019, he was brought back home to St. Mary's Cathedral by Bishop Foyes, whom you see in the lower left-hand photograph. Maz was given a high requiem funeral mass in the style, not a Latin mass, but in the, in the visual style of what Maz's original funeral mass would have been like. But the mass was to a packed cathedral and he was laid to rest in a sarcophagus specially made for him in, a, in the chapel which was prepared for him, which is now called the Maz Chapel. And you can go visit Maz there today. So I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to say about why this thing is here. And I guess, uh, Tara, we can entertain some questions, perhaps. Great. Yes, absolutely. We do have some really good questions. Um, let's see where to begin. Lots of great comments um, in the chat in terms of just, I and I completely agree, how how just really spellbinding spell this presentation has been. It's just been really, really great. Um, Let's get started with um, an easy one. How many gargoyles are there? 26. 20? Well, actually, no, no, no. <laughs> Depends on what you mean by a gargoyle. Uh, a gargoyle okay. is a water spout. What you have on the top, if you look, the gargoyles, if you look at my pointer, are right here. You can see them sticking out. We have 34 of those. We have 26 chimeras but I'm not gonna split hairs. I mean, we can call them gargoyles, everybody does, but technically they're chimeras, which are mythical beasts and monsters and such. But yeah, there's 34, so there's, uh, what is it, 34 and 26? No, there's 32 gargoyles and 26. Cool, So that's awesome. So a couple of people had a th kind of a similar question uh, Courtney says, you know, you say work on cathedrals is never really done. Uh, is there anything in store for the Cathedral Basilica? And then um, we had another question from Betty who says or asks, is there any, are there any unfinished parts still today? <laughs> well, to answer the first question, if you look at the portals, <clears throat> uh, Bishop Foy's uh, has been busy over a number of years uh, finishing the portals. Maz wanted to have these finished in his own time. So you have the central portal. Today we have the original design uh, that Maz wanted in this portal uh, piece right here, this relief, and also in the south portal. Now these are not going to be carved like Clement Barnhorn carved this section here, but we have statues going into each of these jams. These are called jams. And into these are put statues, which are uh, there. Some of them are there in the central portal. They're not there yet, but in the outer portals, they are there. 
and you can see the reliefs on the north and south portal, the smaller ones. But these statues represent uh, all of the parishes in the Diocese of Covington. So they bond, I mean, Maz would just be delighted because it bonds each individual parish to the cathedral itself. There's something, so when you come there, you know, a lot, a lot of the liturgies, uh, the parishes will come like at the Chrism Mass uh, before Easter. You know, all the parishes come to get the holy oils and things blessed and all of that. And they can look and they can point at their statue, the, the, the patron saint of their parish. It's there in the facade. And that's something Maz would be delighted with. Yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and the second question, is there anything unfinished? Yes, I'm afraid there's tons of stuff unfinished. Um, on the inside, I don't have a picture here, but there are whole vistas <clears throat> of walls that do not have murals in them. There's open spaces that still have artwork that can go in them. Um, every bishop usually leaves a little bit of his own mark on improving uh, the cathedral. Uh, after Maz and Brossard, we had a major renovation by uh, Bishop Malloy from uh, in the 1950s. And we had one with Bishop Munch, <clears throat> which is still within memory uh, for a lot, of, a lot of in the audience. And, uh, and he, uh, uh, that was a major renovation. An interesting thing I'll say about that one is I've talked to people, <clears throat> the, the cathedral was closed for eight months and they cleaned the glass windows. And most of the people had never seen the windows cleaned. No one in living memory had seen them cleaned. And when the first mass they walked in there, they, they, they just gasped because they had never seen, one woman told me, she says, I'd never seen so much color. Wow. Suger and Bernard of Clairvaux and all the rest, they're still here. That's amazing. That's so cool. Um, well, I, that brings me to, I think a perfect next question, which is um, what if we want to take a tour or is that possible? It's certainly possible. Um, right now, we don't have public tours. Um, we don't even have private tours because of COVID protocols. Right. We're hoping, um, and this is something we're, we're still sort of waiting for, we're hoping that perhaps in the summer or fall, we might be in a position, <clears throat> depending on how the vaccinations go and what the state and what the, uh, the bishop and the diocese say about the protocols, what we can and cannot do. So we hope to, but... Uh, I would say there's, there, I would say be optimistic, yes. Absolutely, we've gotta be optimistic, that's for sure. Um, let's see, and for our last question, um, you've already told me that this could be its own presentation. So um, I think it would be wonderful if you would come back in April and talk to us about this. But in the meantime, can you somehow briefly talk about Duvenek's role? Well, 1903, Bishop Maz wrote to Duvenek. <clears throat> Duvenek only lived three blocks away. And he was back you know, from Europe. I mean, Elizabeth had died and, uh, and he was teaching at the Art Academy and he, had a, uh, he was sharing a loft with uh, Clement Barnhorn who did all the sculptures. <clears throat> but 1903 began the relationship between Maz and Duvenek. And Maz asked him if he would paint the, wall, the murals on the Blessed Sacrament Chapel walls. Duvenek responded by sending back sketches, which in a letter that we still have a copy of, Maz was delighted and he loved it. And the sketch that we, that is the, the, the murals are pretty much like what his sketches were. There were a few changes here and there. If you go to the Cincinnati Art Museum archives, you can see some of his studies, his painting studies that he did for this painting. But he, he worked on it from about 1904 to 1909 when he hung, when he finished the triptych, uh, which is the three paneled one, the big one. And then he finished the other one, which is up on the high west wall uh, on the other side of the, uh, the choir loft in 1910. Um, Duvenek, interestingly, uh, uh, James Ott, Jim Ott knows a lot more about Duvenek and his role in religious art than I do. But Duvenek started out as a religious artist, which is some people know and some people don't. His first teacher was Johann Schmidt, who, uh, yeah, Johann Schmidt, I was Schmidt, Johann, too many Schmidts in my story, uh, by Johann Schmidt, who painted Mother of God Church. 
um, and Johann Schmidt was my great uncle's teacher as well. So I, I'm familiar with Johann Schmidt. But Duvenac, he painted, a, he started out with religious art. And then he, when he went to Paris and he started going to learn the academic method and such, he gravitated into other, uh, other art forms. Of course, uh, he's probably best known for the, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, Royal Bavarian Royal Academy in Munich, where, where he learned all the darkness that appears like in the, the Whistling Boy and such like that. But his murals, Duvenek didn't hang them himself. They are uh, oil on canvas, which is affixed to the wall. And in 1920, they were coming down. I'll tell you a little side story. I know we're running over here, but I'll tell you a little side story. Uh, and it is in one of my stories in the Tribune, but his murals in 1919 were coming off the wall. And the, the sizing that was used on the back and the glaze that was used uh, on the front were, was damaging the paint. And these things were literally coming off, peeling off the wall. So they hired a uh, Cincinnati art restoration fellow named William Blank uh, to come in and he took them off the wall. He had to cut them up in pieces. He took them to his studio in Cincinnati and with his own hand, he had to retouch the Duvenex. And then he brought them, and we have all of this in a letter that William Blank wrote to uh, Bross, Bishop Brossard. Uh, and so he brought it back and he says, I've, I have my own sizing of my own formula. I have my own glaze that I made up myself. All you will ever, these, these will stay up for the centuries and all you'll ever need is some ivory soap. And it's been up there for a hundred years and it hasn't come off yet. And the glazing is still beautiful. In the 2000 renovation, all they had to do was, you know, just just clean the surface. That is that is amazing. Um, well, I do think it would be great to have you back and talk a little bit more and, and maybe we can, uh, I know there's the exhibit right now going on about Dupinek at the uh, at the art museum. So we've been trying to figure out how to connect with them. Um, I have one last question and then we're gonna let everybody go because we are a little bit over. Can you, um, someone actually sent me a text about this and then it's in the chat as well. Um, there is a book, Stories in Glass, The Windows of the Cathedral Basilica of the Assumption. Yes. Um, where could someone get that book if they wanted to learn more about the windows? That is an excellent book by Monsignor William Cleves. And uh, the, it's available at the cathedral. Uh, typically right now, uh, we it's, it's sort of put away in drawers because of protocols and things because we don't have anybody coming in on tours. But uh, if you, I would say if you email uh, the parish offices and express your interest in acquiring a copy, I think something could be, could be done to that. And right. I tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask, or I'll ask uh, the people in charge and see if we can make some other uh, arrangement and perhaps make those more conveniently available for you if you'd like. Absolutely. You know, and if you do that, um, if there was a link or an email or some kind of contact, um, I'd be happy to put that up on the Facebook page um, where we have this streaming live. So anybody who's watched it um, can go right there and find out more, so. Yeah, just let me uh, just just finish here. I mean, if, if people wanna read more about the cathedral, they can just go to nkytribune.com and then just put my name in the search field, the full and the, la the first and the last name and they'll all come up and you can just pick and choose. Yeah, I tested it earlier and it definitely works. So definitely <laughs> encourage everybody. I posted one link to get them started in the chat, but there were there were quite a few. So um, I know I plan to read some more and um, really appreciate this presentation. It has been um, a lot of fun to learn more about. And um, I, I saw one person in fa on Facebook, um, I don't know how they did it, but they apparently had an opportunity to go on the roof so I'll just put it out there that if there's ever that opportunity, I'd be happy to do that um, and uh, and check out the chimeras. That sounds really cool. So well, I, I got to say, unfortunately, well, OK, I'll leave it go with that. <laughs> OK, um, well, so thank you again for joining us. Uh, great presentation. Yeah. I do want to let everybody know and thanks for sticking with us that next week, um, Arnold Taylor with uh, Kenton County Historical Society is going to give us a presentation about cholera in northern Kentucky and uh, you know from one pandemic to uh, to the next I guess so anyway um,
we look forward to, oh, thank you. We look forward to um, seeing everyone next week to talk about that. And um, we have some, we actually have all of the presentations uh, scheduled through April and there's a lot of great content. So we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for having me.